Wrapping with Reef Bum is sponsored by Bulk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine. Hey, what's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Wrapping with Reef Bum. I'm your host, Keith Berkelhammer. Sorry we're late, sorry we're late, but uh, to some gremlins that we had to, uh, to deal with, and I'm very, very excited to welcome back two legends in the hobby, Julian Sprung and Charles Delbake. What's going on, gentlemen? Here we are. Here we are. It's finally. Uh, it's four o'clock on the west coast and seven o'clock on the east coast. And Keith, you're in the middle somewhere. Ah, uh, east coast. East coast. East coast. Yeah. Uh, east. Yeah. Now, now it's seven twenty-four. We're really late, but uh, I, and I have no idea what happened there. We were just uh, Skype was fighting us tonight there, and, and uh, somehow we uh, were able to to connect. So that is a, a very good thing. And uh, sorry, folks out there for uh, for us being late, but I think it'll definitely be worth uh, hanging out for. Um, just um, just for those that don't know Charles and Julian, uh, they're both very well known for co-authoring a revolutionary series of books called The Reef Aquarium. There are three volumes. Julian has published other books and written numerous articles about the hobby. He co-founded his company, Two Little Fishies, with Daniel Ramirez back in 1991. Julian is also a frequent speaker at aquarium conferences and club events. Um, besides being an author and lecturer, Charles is currently the curator of aquarium projects at Steinhardt Aquarium in San Francisco, California. Prior to that, he uh, worked at the Waikiki Aquarium with Dr. Bruce Carlson. Charles was also one of the driving forces behind organizing the first ever Magna in 1989, which was held in Toronto, where he lived. So before we start chatting with Julian and Charles, I want to thank the sponsors for the show, both Bulk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine. I really appreciate them supporting the live stream. And I also appreciate you folks out there for tuning in and joining the uh, conversation. As always, feel free to drop your comments and questions in the chat. And I encourage you to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already so uh gentlemen let's um i think there's a couple of main topics we want to talk about tonight we want to talk about bacteria and uh, i think also problematic algae and, and and i think maybe let's start with the um the topic of problematic algae that's um there's there's just so many different facets of that and that's a uh, an issue with a lot of folks 
struggle with. And, and, you know, so I have a bunch of questions for you guys, but um, certainly anybody out there that uh, would like to drop a question in the chat, feel free to uh, do so. I'll do my best to uh, keep track of those um, comments. Let's, let's talk about, um, start with bacteria additives. You know, there's, there's several in the marketplace. Julian, you have one called um, Bactiv8. I think that's how it's um, pronounced. You know, so I'm, I'm talking about bacteria that um, you would not use to start a tank, you know, like nitrifying bacteria. I'm, I'm talking about bacteria that you would be dosing to an established reef tank. So, you know, I, I guess, you know, and, and I use, um, I've used those products before. I, I currently use the um, um, bacteria product on a daily basis for my mature reef tanks. Is, is that something that you can lean on by itself to help control nutrients in a reef tank or is that something that you probably should be using in conjunction with something else i don't know who wants to take that question first well i think the guy um, who makes it should talk about it <laughs> you know for the different products you really kind of need to talk to the manufacturer but um uh, you know um Bactivate, we we brought that to market mainly as a seed uh, bacteria for uh, working with MPX bioplastics, so the biopellet um, process. Of course, um, the heterotrophic bacteria that are contained in it um, can be dosed on a daily basis and they do uh, break down um, dissolved and solid organic matter uh, in the system. Um, and there are a number of products in, in the marketplace that are designed specifically for that. But your, your question, I think, really was getting at, you know, should one be dosing some organic food as well as the bacteria to accomplish that? Uh, I mean, that, that's sort of around the idea of what we were doing with the NPX bioplastics and the Bactivate. Uh, and sure, adding, you know, uh, it could be methanol, could be uh, some simple sugars. There's a lot of different organic things you could be adding. Uh, I have not developed a protocol um, uh, to have a reproducible uh, technique of, of using our product uh, for, for that kind of purposes you're proposing. I do know that, uh, that just dosing it without um, adding an organic, uh, you know, you can see the benefits of doing that, um, you know, cleaner substrate, um, the corals, and you know, will respond positively after you add it. Uh, and I don't know whether that's simply uh, the product acting as a food for them or the corals responding to some uh, water chemistry change. Um, there's a whole lot of work that could be done studying this. Yeah. That's my, that's my, like, I, I, oh, first, just, just as a disclaimer, I've never tried any of these products and, uh, and I don't really know a lot about them, but I, I always, I do know that whenever you're adding something to the tank, it would really be nice to have some method to be able to measure what the consequences of that are. And when you're talking about bacteria, I mean, unless you have a method to analyze the, the bacterial populations in your tank, you know, you don't know, first, what well, you're starting off with, and secondly, you don't know what the effects are of adding these bacteria to the system, other than it's all purely anecdotal, from what I can tell of people's reactions to what they see. Um, maybe they're doing some water chemistry measurements. Um, certainly, there's, you know, a lot of to be said for feeding the tank with organic matter to enhance the growth of certain bacteria, but you know, for nitrogen uptake and, and, and phosphorus uptake as well. That, that certainly works. We know, we've known that for decades with uh, adding ethanol and vodka and things like that. Uh, but it's, it's something that can get away from you very quickly. Um, there's, there's downsides in terms of the amount of bacteria that might be produced during the water cloudy, creating more sludge. Um, I know in, in external um, heterotrophic filters, that's what builds up on these screens is huge mats of bacterial mass that have to be then removed manually and, and can re reduce flow so they have to be kept clean. So there's some some caveats in adding these kinds of products. I mean, again, I could go back to 
um, I don't really know what they do because I can't measure what's in the tank and I can't tell what they're what effect they're having on the overall bacterial population. And we're just talking now about the tank in general and haven't even talked about what it does to the the holobon group of bacteria that actually live on coral. Yeah. And I know there's a lot of, you know, uh, claims out there by literature of, of products that will, you know, they'll, they're beneficial bacteria, they help to outcompete the pathogenic bacteria. But as Julian says, I'd really like to see somebody studying this. And there are enough people with microbiology backgrounds in this hobby that I think um, that some of them, this would be a really great project to work on. Yeah, I mean, what I've, what I've heard about these products is that, um, you know, corals do consume bacteria as, as food, as a food source, right? Is, um, is that a correct statement? Yeah, I think that's pretty safe to say. Um, of course, they have bacteria living all over their surface and their mucus and all, but um, they are, they have to be consumed. Right, so. and... Um, Right. So but I think it's also a very generalistic statement. I mean, there are certain corals that probably are more reliant on it than others. Right. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, so I, I think that's one benefit I've heard about the um, these products. But again, yeah, like you guys are saying, it um, it would be great to have some sort of quantifiable data to show us what bacteria, you know, would make a positive difference in terms of the corals that, um, you know, in terms of what we're dosing into the tank and whether that is actually having a positive, um, you know, impact. I guess there's there's a lot of research to be done about that. You know, the other part of it is that, um, you know, these types of bacteria do help reduce nitrates and phosphates, which can help control nutrients. But, you know, again, like Charles, what you're saying, you know, in terms of carbon dosing, you know, that's one thing where it can get away from you very quickly. And if you have too um, much of a bacteria population, then uh, you could have some rapid reduction in nutrients, and that wouldn't be a good thing. And oxygen. Uh, yeah. And, right. Yes. Uh, yeah, you know, so it's, it's, it's something that I, I have um, been using, you know, the last um, couple of years. And, and, um, but, I, you know, I think it's a lot of anecdotal in terms of, the, the pluses and the minuses, and I, it, it doesn't seem to be doing any harm to my tank. It seems to be tanks. It, it seems that um, it does help keep nitrates and phosphates lower than if I was not using, you know, the product. So, um, you know, but I, I guess the other thing is, is um, you know, there's there's a whole bunch of things you can do to control nutrients in terms of using a skimmer and, and uh, water changes and all that sort of thing. So, you know, how does dosing bacteria kind of fit into that whole other routine in terms of, you know, how you operate a reef tank. Well, your fractionator is going to remove the bacteria as well. And so and that's the whole basis behind the carbon dosing is that these bacteria are then removed by the fractionator. And in fact, in some designs, you know, and that where there's an external heterotrophic bacterial denitrifying filter, the effluent is sent directly to the intake of a fractionator. Um, so even if you're adding these products, I'm sure that some of it's coming out in your skimmate as well, and as well as being and ingested. That, right, and that may be the main reason why you're seeing lower nutrient levels. So, so the question is, if you stop putting the stop dosing those bacteria and just added a carbon source, would you see a similar maintenance of low nitrogen and phosphorus? I mean, that's that's the question. Right. Um, now, Charles, I know you don't use the, uh, the, the, the that type of product, but Julian, is is that something that you would recommend to somebody in terms of you know having that in the mix in terms of fighting an algae issue? Um, it, it is one one technique. So and and for two reasons: one, uh, the nutrient reduction that you pointed out, um, and the other may be just simply a biological one of of competing. Um, not just competing for the nutrients that the algae are competing for, but also um, interactions between bacteria and algae. Uh, so, and when we say algae, we're referring uh, to a very broad group of uh, <laughs> things that are photosynthetic and not all of them are actually uh, algae. You know, when people complain about some problem in their tank, they include cyanobacteria. Um, and yeah, dosing, uh, you know, basically a probiotic technique of managing cyanobacteria, dosing uh, bacteria can uh, get you past a, a um, 
red slime or green slime of these uh, troublesome cyanobacteria. Um, it's not, you know, a magic bullet, but it, it's one technique that can be used. Uh, more, more effective, in my opinion, is, you know, uh, working on the nutrient levels, getting the, um, uh, for cyanobacteria in, in reef tanks, uh, usually getting the alkalinity up um, and dissolved organics down uh, using activated carbon, I find, you know, to be very helpful, effective in that. Um, but yeah, dosing bacteria. What, can um, what alkalinity level in terms of, you know, raising the alkalinity would you say, what, what you, should you be shooting for? Um, well, I mean, just a normal level, I, I try to maintain a alkalinity of around eight. Um, when the alkalinity falls below that, which it does very quickly when you've got corals growing, um, conditions are more conducive to growing cyanobacteria and green hair algae. That's why they're so common. Um, so, and, and it's not like, you know, you just treat it and you're done. Alkalinity is something that on a continuous basis, hour to hour is being drawn down by the calcifying organisms. So that's why it's important to have a, a system that's maintaining uh, calcium and alkalinity all, you know, on an hourly basis. These what um yeah. so what what do you guys think about a three to five day blackout to address algae issues? Is that a is that a band aid or again is that something that can be used effectively if you figure out what the source of the issue is? Personally, I've never found that to be effective. Um, you know, I think people recommend that most for dinoflagellates. Um, and then, of course, if they put light back on, they just usually come right back. Uh, so, yeah, it's more important to address the, you know, the, the root cause. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Julian. I mean, a lot of times, uh, sometimes turning the lights off is, you know, it gives you a, a warm, fuzzy feeling inside because the algae goes away and then then after a week or so it's back again and so it's a short short term uh hive so to say but uh also it's often used in conjunction with another treatment like using um some kind of a um antibiotic treatment like chemiclean or something like that because if the light can inactivate that compound much more quickly i will give you one anecdotal um uh 180 degree other option when I had a, I had a display tank at Waikiki Aquarium that was a closed system, and I had um, a cyano issues in there on the sand quite a lot. And one, and I had uh, there was a malfunction with the timer, and unbeknownst to me, because I go home at five o'clock, that the lights were on all night long, Ooh. and that hap that ran for three days, and I never saw a cyano again after that. <laughs> it just burned it out. That's what I, it just sucked oh. up whatever it was, you know, it just burned it out because it basically sucked yeah. up whatever it was living on and that was it. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. There were a couple of things. You had light saturation yep. uh, and if they, do, if they were on the substrate and they were developing a lot of oxygen for a long period, they made, the mats may have floated up and then got pulled into the filter. No, it was just gone. Uh, it was, it was just, just gone. gone. Anyway, yeah. chew on that. that. You burned, yeah, like bleaching corals. You bleached uh, your yeah. That once happened to me. I yeah. I, uh, I went away for a trip and um, left the tank to my wife, and and there was something going on with the lights. And, and well, you're in trouble now. Yeah, and I, after saying I, that, I she's not listening. <laughs> but yeah, and, but uh, she cool. she flipped a button or something on the uh, on the light timer, and um, so the lights just stayed on constantly for i think for it was like three or four days and um i can't remember if i lost any coral or not but i think what i had one fish that looked like it was sunburned it was just uh or maybe it was just so tired because it had no sleep for the last uh you know three or four days but uh yeah interesting um let me just read some comments in the chat flippers reef been dosing mb7 which is a uh, bacteria from uh, bright wells now weekly for a couple of years corals color growth has been phenomenal uh, just my two cents worth. Uh, Bill Saltwater having, I want more data on bacteria dosing before using. Did without it for 25 years. Can do without it for now. Um, 
on the uh, blackouts. Burt Minshew, never ever done a blackout unless I don't grow coral. Yeah, I, you know, it always kind of worries me about uh, doing a blackout in a tank with coral, even though I know people say that corals, you know, survive three days in darkness being transshipped, but that scares me. Um, yeah. Well, it's not something that either of us are recommending, <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> um, what else we got here? Uh, ta -da 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 -da. Yeah, okay. Um, so, Charles, you mentioned uh, ChemiClean, which kind of leads into my next question in terms of using chemicals. I'm going to kind of venture a guess here and say that both of you folks uh, do not recommend using chemicals to fight algae. Is that a correct assumption? Yeah. When you say chemicals, what are you talking oh, about? Oh, ChemiClean, fluconazole. You mean like antibiotics? Yeah. yeah. I think uh, I, we were, you know, we've used it uh, in our in our big reef tank and uh, as a last ditch effort to address a red algal issue that we had, um, and it worked. So. So there you go. It worked for us. And, uh, you know, it, what, it did stress some of the corals out. Um, we also had some tridacna clams that were starting to show recession. And after that treatment, they were wide open again. And stupid me, I didn't, I didn't follow that up with subsequent dips. And uh, in, a, in about a month, it started to recede again and then was gone. So I always thought if I ever got that opportunity again, I would repeat that. I think the thing yeah. with, with me in terms of using chemicals is that, um, and and um, maybe you guys solved the uh, the issue, uh, Charles, in terms of the source of the problem. But I always, you know, was kind of of the uh, the thinking that if you don't figure out what the source of the issue is that caused the sign in the first place, if you if you hit it with the uh, with the ChemiClean, then it's going to come back eventually. Because I've used ChemiClean a couple of times uh, a number of years ago, and that was kind of my experience with it. It, it did eventually return. Yeah, it, we didn't have it come back. Um, we did uh, identify the, what the issue was, and that was uh, iron. So we had um, some very large uh, reactors built for us to use with our GFO. And over time, what happened was that we, you know, we just no one had built reactors this big before for GFO. So we tried a couple of things and. Um, and just basically guessed, guesstimated what these the, the size of these reactors should be. And what it turned out was that the media was grinding in there. So on a whim, I just, you know, we were battling this algae for several months. So we were diving and we were siphoning it out and it was just became unmanageable. We just couldn't keep up with it. And it was really draining for the team to try to maintain that. So take it, this isn't a 212,000 gallon tank. Big. So, um, so we, I took some algae samples, I sent them to colleagues in Hawaii, and they came back with uh, a type of red algae that they said is very common around shipwrecks because it feeds off iron. So, on a, so I had the lab test for iron, and it was like 0.2 something. So it was about 10 to 100 times higher than natural seawater. So on a whim, I said, well, let's filter it. So we filtered the water through a submicron filter and, they, and the, the number that came back then was 0 0.01. So that told me that there was some kind of particulate. So we basically eliminated those reactors. We used the ChemiClean, and we never had an issue again after that. Interesting. Um, so, Julian, you mentioned something when we were talking uh, before about um, fighting algae, about, you know, uh, one, one of the, uh, the things that typically you would have in your arsenal is to lower nutrients to help, help that, um, you know, Fight back any uh, kind of cyano or other kind of um, or or, uh, or problematic algae since cyano is not uh, algae per se. But um, Rich Ross has been making the rounds at, at conferences with a presentation about fighting algae, and and I just kind of wanted to um, um, regurgitate what, uh, what part of that presentation and get your your guys' thoughts on this. You know, he has a video with a duck um, with a duck and a cat, and the uh, cat represented the corals and the duck was the algae and in the video the duck was eating all the food in front of the cat before the cat had a chance to um, eat it so the point that he was making is that the algae is very opportunistic you know when it comes to consuming nitrates and phosphates so the question that he posed and i want to get your thoughts on this is does it make sense 
for people with algae issues to try and lower nutrients. You hear that um, a lot. Do you really want to starve the cat, right? So I guess um, you're, you're trying to reduce the uh, nitrates and phosphates so much to starve out the algae, but are you really also starving out corals in the process? Is, is that a slippery slope? Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, but um, I don't know how many hobbyists are, are out there. They, they can't all be wrong by, you know, chasing the, the, the algae uh, issue by, by trying to reduce nutrients and, and succeeding at it. Just need to shoot the um, duck. <laughs> shoot the duck. The duck is quacking. It's, you know, but it's true that the corals are using the same nutrients and if you drop the nutrient levels too low, you're, you know, potentially harming the corals. Uh, most home aquarists don't get there. Um, or if they do, it's because their system is, has hit a, a nice plane. It's, it's working biologically very well. And then they don't need to be chasing the nutrients. The corals are growing and, and they have their built in, uh, you know, coral getting all the nutrients it needs and the algae starving. Uh, so that happens. And, you know, we all try to, to get to that goal. We use herbivores as well to assist, um, because even at very low nutrient levels, algae can persist. Um, but I, I want to point out also that, that when we talk about nutrients, we tend to focus on nitrate, um, and sure, Corals can utilize nitrate and algae can utilize nitrate, but they really prefer uh, the ammonium. So that, you know, it's easier for them to assimilate. Um, and getting the nitrate level down is not necessarily a bad thing, but I, I don't want to uh, give the impression that I believe nitrate is so terribly harmful. I've seen plenty of wonderful tanks with relatively high nitrate levels. Um, phosphate is more of a, a tricky one, um, because, uh, it doesn't take much phosphate to really make algae grow, especially if you have iron available as well. Uh, these are important plant nutrients. Um, I, I really haven't seen nitrate to be as, uh, directly related to problems with algae as phosphate is. Um, personal observation. So, uh, you know, I would go all the way back to when we were first exposed to algae turf scrubbers that, back in the 80s. Yeah. And one of the issues that we postulated on, which was that the algae turf scrubbers in some of those systems were too efficient and they were actually outcompeting yeah. the corals for nutrients. And one of the observations that was made by one of the aquarists at the Smithsonian was that when they pulled out some of these corals and started actually feeding them, they recovered. And so, you know, you can get to the point where the algae is definitely out competing the coral. But I also know that when I, we worked at Waikiki Aquarium and we set up small tanks, that we would have algae issues as well, especially uh, bryopsis. But once the coral started to grow in and those tubs outside became jam-packed with coral, algae was barely noticeable. Um, and the paper that Marlon Atkinson did with Jerry Crow um, back in the early 90s, where they analyzed the water going into these tanks and leaving, showed that basically the coral sucked everything out of the water. And so the algae wouldn't have a chance. So to Julian's point, you know, once you have a dense enough growth of coral, they tend to outcompete the algae. But as Julian said too, I said I don't. We don't run our systems as low as some of these reefs really are, and um, you know, so I don't know that there's a danger. I mean, I, I don't doubt what Rich has got a very good analogy there. I think that is there's a valid some, there's valid points to that, um, but there are other ways that the corals can get nutrition, such as zooxanthellae, and through food. That there are other sources of nitrogen and phosphorus is through food. And also, as Julian said, that the preferred form of nitrogen is ammonia. Uh, for plants and, and corals in particular to take up nitrate, uh, they have to go through several steps to get the nitrogen out of that molecule. So it's energetically more expensive for them and more taxing to get the nitrogen. So 
it may also be that there's just it's too much ammonia being produced that's fueling the growth because of overfeeding because of uh, you know not uh, mechanical filters not being maintained and basically it's just heterotrophic bacteria breaking down waste and producing this ammonia hey uh, charles you mentioned uh, algae scrubbers is this an opportune time to um address that coral magazine um article that attributed some comments to you about the uh, algae scrubber sure okay sure so yeah i just you know there was an article that came out i think it was the november december issue and, and we're talking to us about talking about um some comments that we had made in volume one of the reef aquarium and you know that was that book was published in 1994 and so we had been observing the algae turf scrubber systems at the Smithsonian, at the Pittsburgh Aqua Zoo, at the Ontario Science Center, since the late '80s, and um, you know some of the comments about you know the water was yellow because of the lighting. Well, they have natural sunlight in the Great Barrier Reef Aquarium, which also had algae turf scrubbers, and their water was also yellow. So they actually started using ozone to get that color out. Now, is the yellow a bad thing? No, but uh, maybe it's, a, it's basically organics. But the the denial that that had anything to do with the turf scrubbers was something that just didn't ring true. Um, but and there was a, and and then as they got developed more and the systems were transferred to Bill Hoffman down in Florida, who then added carbon. He added fractionators and made some other tweaks. Uh, you can see that the potential for those turf scrubbers to really keep low nutrient levels was there, as long as the system was managed in a way to manage some of the shortcomings of it. So. By volume three, which we published in in two thousand and five, wow. we uh, you know we had we had a different opinion on it because the technology and mainly the husbandry um, was uh, had been altered and taking in some of the criticisms from the early systems and some of the downfalls of the early systems um, that were addressed by by basically improved husbandry. Right, I, th I think the main factor in in the success that bill had uh was the calcium and alkalinity issue that's such a, a key factor if you want to grow corals you just have to keep up with their calcium and alkalinity demand and the original systems back in the 1980s had calcium and alkalinity supplementation but basically it was done by running uh top off water over uh halamita you know calcium carbonate substrate and as you know the, the solubility is relatively low um it, you know it's just not enough to keep it wasn't up. also the freshwater in dc isn't it also particularly hard yeah but still again right. not enough but that's what uh, they were adding as well for evaporation right. even though they yeah. were claiming uh, that they weren't adding supplements they they were yeah okay but, in any case, uh, I think that, you know, our original comments um, were focusing on, you know, some physical things that were easy to see, that, like the, the effect on the, the water clarity and, and color of the water, which, you know, affects the spectrum of light that the corals are, are getting. Um, you know, but I, I think the main thing that, that made the difference um, for Bill Hoffman was that calcium and alkalinity. And then, of course, using activated carbon and skimming, it, you know, pushes it closer to, uh, you know, what we can achieve with our Berlin systems. Um, but with the advantage of the reverse daylight and the nutrient control using the turf scrubbers, and, and clearly he demonstrated that they had value. Um, and so, you know, we were able to say that in volume three, that it's not the scrubbers themselves that are intri intrinsically harmful in any way. It was the husbandry, as you said, Charles, um, you know, the basic uh, overall technique of maintaining it. And you can system. see by, you know, the, the, the plethora of algae yeah. scrubbers that are out there now and the people that are having success yeah. along with good husbandry. So, I mean, and, and it, you know, yeah. there's, there's more than one way to do these, to do a reef tank. And this is one of the ways. And then as hobbyists often do, they combine and take from different philosophies and, and make and combine them together to, to achieve some success. I was, I was in Holland right. in, uh, last July and I, I was taken around to see, I saw five tanks in one gentleman's home and, a, and about three other tanks. 
None of them had uh, calcium reactors. Uh, they're all using liquid supplements. Uh, the five tanks in the one gentleman's home had no fractionators, no carbon, and uh, the water was crystal clear and had been running for over 10 years with no water changes hmm. and filled with coral. So <laughs> there's a lot to be learned. And there's a lot of different ways to, yeah. to get to one's desired goal. Yeah, I wanted to comment before Keith, um, you know, back on, on the whole issue of yellow water with algal turf uh, scrubbers, um, most aquariums, whether they're fish only or reef aquariums, if you're not using activated carbon, the water is going to turn yellow. Uh, it's the aquariums where, as you mentioned, where you don't see that happening, it's intriguing. Of course, there's um, one technique is, is using ozone to, you know, uh, oxidize the organics. But, but in systems where there's some kind of a biological effect that, that limits the accumulation of uh, the dissolved organic compounds that turn it yellow, that's, that's a fascinating area to, to explore, uh, to understand why, what, what gives it that uh, capacity. Uh, but in general, for most aquarium hobbyists, um, you know, if you are running a system, whether it's with a turf filter or not, uh, take a white bucket and draw water out after a couple of months, it's going to be yellow. It's not going to be uh, or colorless. Else, or else we wouldn't have had been using activated carbon for the last 50 years. <laughs> yeah. Serious. Yeah, that's right. Uh, what, what about, uh, you know, when you're, when you're using a, a turf scrubber or refugium or whatever, if you're using macro and um, you need to dose nitrates and phosphates? I mean, that's, that's a, uh, it's a relatively new phenomenon over the last uh, 10 or 15 years, right, in terms of dosing nitrates and phosphates. But, you know, again, it, it's a whole uh, give or take, right, in, in terms of whether or not you need to do that. Maybe uh, you, um, you just have to feed your fish more to, to increase the nitrate. Exactly. Have a bigger, bigger fish population. Right. So I guess my question to you guys is how important is it to, um, to keep on top of that in terms of dosing nitrates and phosphates, or is it not really that important? Is it just a matter of making other adjustments in terms of the husbandry? Well, I, I think when you say how important is it, it depends who you are. Are you a hobbyist with one aquarium or are you a coral farm with, you know, chock full of corals? If you're a coral farm, it's really important. Or for the average hobbyist, it's probably not important at all. Um, and I think that's probably most of the people who are I mean, You also will see that in tanks that don't have algal filters. You know, um, mm -hmm. you, you'll see yeah. where the nitrates, they feel that the, the nitrogen level is too low or the phosphorus level is too low. Um, so it's, it's a very interesting and it's a very complex topic, the whole nitrogen phosphorus ratios. And, you know, I see a lot of people, yeah. I mean, I think Keith, you were mentioning in your synopsis for today, you wanted to talk about the red field ratio and this whole thing. I mean, th this is this magical ratio of 16 to one of nitrogen to phosphorus. And it's based on work with microalgae and bacteria. Um, so it's how translatable is it? I don't know. The other thing that people have to realize is that 16 to 1 is a molar ratio of nitrogen to phosphorus. It's, you can't just plug in your nitrate value and your phosphate value and look to see if it's 16 to 1. You have to convert. Well, first you've got to, most test kits are measuring phosphate, so you have to convert that to phosphate phosphorus. So you have to get just the phosphorus component, and then you have to do the same with your nitrate. But the total, the N and the N equation of, is all the nitrogen. So it's your ammonia, it's your uh, nitrite, and it's your nitrate. And it's also uh, organic nitrogen. So you have all okay. the, the organic nitrogen is something you can't measure. You can measure total nitrogen if you have the right kits in chemistry. And you basically will measure the inorganic nitrogen, which is the nitrate, nitrate, look, nitrate, nitrate, and... Uh, uh, ammonia, nitrite, so those three. And and then you do the math and you figure out roughly what your organic nitrogen level is. But once you've got the nitrate, nitrogen, phosphate, phosphorus numbers, it's still in milligrams per liter, so now you have to convert it to molar. So there's actually a massic ratio for, by massic I mean the, if you're doing milligrams per liter, and I believe it's, 
I think it's 23 to 1 or 43 to 1 of nitrogen to phosphorus. So it's different than the 16 to 1. Because as I started by saying, the 16 to 1 is a molar ratio. So that's one, the first thing you need to realize about that ratio. The second thing is that I uh, have a good friend of mine, Max Janssen, who's the curator at the uh, Burgers Ocean in Arnhem in the Netherlands, who has a fantastic 180,000 gallon live reef tank that's been running for over almost 20 years now. And it's filled with huge colonies of corals. And he's he has a paper out where he talks about the, he went to the literature and got values of different reefs. And I took those numbers for nitrogen and phosphorus and I ran it through the, the, cal the conversions to molar. And most of them are not 16 to 1. They're like 3 to 1 or 2 to 1. Then there's others like off of Florida and the Bahamas that are 20 to 1 or 30 to 1. So there's this huge variation in natural reefs. So how useful is this ratio really? And I know Max tries to, to maintain that 16 to 1 ratio uh, as a matter of course. And that, that falls into the whole, okay, I need to add some more nitrogen because my, now my, my corals are, are uh, nitrogen limited because I have enough phosphate, but now I don't have enough nitrogen. Or the opposite, I've got lots of nitrogen, but I don't have enough phosphorus. So I need to add a little bit more phosphorus or just feed your fish for. But, but the big difference between his tank and our tank is the fish population. He has much fewer fish than we do. We mm. just finished our census, and we've we've been as high as 1,300 fish, but uh, <clears throat> currently we have 727 fish in there in 212,000 gallons. And I would say he has maybe uh, less than half that. Wow. Uh, so, Julian, your thoughts in terms of that uh, that ratio, how, how, uh, how important is that if... Um... You know, you're you're trying to uh, combat an algae issue. Um, neither when I wrote the book, nor since <laughs> in the book on algae, have I um, explored that as an angle for controlling algae. Um, it's an open area for research to see whether tweaking uh, those values will curb or enhance algae growth? I don't know the answer to that. So I've always focused, the levers, the buttons that I push um, are calcium and alkalinity, maintain those higher. Um, and again, I've never known why that was so. Uh, I just know that, you know, uh, boosting alkalinity uh, curbs the growth of the two main problem types, the red cyano and the green hair algae. Um, and that because, because corals are growing when the alkalinity falls, that's when you see the algae show up. Uh, the other is that um, it, focusing on phosphate to lower that has been very, very helpful, not just with uh, cyanobacteria and green hair, but also um, diatoms um, and, you know, even bryopsis uh, to an extent. Bryopsis is, <laughs> bryopsis is, you know, able to subsist at really, really low nutrient levels. Yeah, I think uh, we had a conversation. I can't remember if it was the last time um, the three of us were on, or if I had you on solo, Julian. I remember we were talking about um, bryopsis and that you had the uh, the bryopsis issue with your your tank uh, um, outdoors. <laughs> Yes. And and you um you basically just fought it with good old hard uh, elbow grease versus uh, blasting it with fluconazole. Right, but uh, you know fluconazole has proven its efficacy, and so I I think that hmm. you know for a public aquarium or a home aquarium, if if it's a, a real big problem with bryopsis, that I I'm not opposed to treating. Uh, with with the pond, I I really I have many many months of of pulling out gobs and gobs of the bryopsis and the bryopsis is still there. Uh, you know, it has its little refugia places where it, it sort of hangs out, but it's not taken over like it did in that initial phase when the pond was fairly well, new. I, I battled bryopsis at Waikiki for many, many years. And, and it's because our well water was elevated in phosphorus and nitrogen. It wasn't huge amounts, but compared to the ocean, it was 10 to 50 times higher. And it was manual removal, and eventually uh, it stuck. It went away, and 
Um, yeah. When I had built the big coral tank, it was like a 5,000 gallon coral tank, it had bryopsis. And I, again, I was plucking and siphoning all the time. And just before I left there in 2008, it was pretty well gone. And then when I left, uh, the people that took it over decided to start trickling in well water again, and it came back. But the other thing about bryopsis is it has a hold fast that actually penetrates into the substrate. So whatever you pull off the top, there's still almost like, we, for lack of a better word, a root that's in the rock. And that's where it's pulling the, the nutrients from as well. So it's difficult. And, and there was also researchers at University of Hawaii that were working on it. And they told me, you can it will reproduce from a single cell. So it, when you break it out and release the cells and you have to really siphon it at the same time. It's, it's interesting you say that because in, in uh, both of my systems, I've got like a little bryopsis that grows here and there, you know, and um, I, I had it uh, grow on one, one part of my live rock and I just took um, some two part epoxy. I, I put it over it and it has not um, come back. But, you know, I also have it um, growing on, on a couple of my return pipes on one of my display tanks. And so uh, a few weeks ago, I just uh, said, you know what, I'm going to, during a water change, I'm going to scrub the crap out of those uh, two return pipes and just do everything, I, you know, take a little razor blade, scrape, 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 toothbrush, uh, you know, scrub it really hard and, and just really get it down to like, you know, brand new pipe. And sure enough, the son of a gun, I mean, it grew back. And um, I guess what you're saying is if it's one cell's left over, that's good enough for it to uh, regrow. Yeah, and it, it likes to be in those spots uh, high up where there's a strong flow. High flow. Yeah. yeah, which makes sense because for algae, uh, the more light you have, the more, <laughs> the faster you can grow. And, the, and if you're in a place with high flow, you get more nutrients, more molecules pass you. Uh, so, yeah, a little anecdote that when, in, when I was working at the, in Hawaii, they, um, it, there was an area that was close to shore where it was very prolific. And it was an area where there was a lot of groundwater intrusion. So you would see like the rippling in the water, the freshwater lens that was coming in, that was runoff. And that was always growing in that area. And they would find the nudibranchs that feed on it in there. So there was a research group at the University of Hawaii that was looking at these nudibranchs because the bryopsis produces a chemical that apparently is efficacious against colon cancer. And so they, the nudibranchs would concentrate this in their tissues. And so they needed to collect, I don't know how many thousands of nudibranchs to get like a few grams of this material. But they came to us saying they couldn't, they couldn't grow it. They, you know, they wanted to grow more bryopsis, but they couldn't. I said, well, come on over. I got, I got yeah. buckets of it. I can give you buckets every day. Yeah, that, that was uh, something I always used to say tongue in cheek, you know, and it's not just about bryopsis, any, any kind of pest that, you know, a sure way to get rid of it is to love it. Just, you know, cherish it, <laughs> say that more, it's reverse psychology. It's the most beautiful algae ever. Right. <laughs> Wavy. Uh, Deep green, forest green. Uh, so, Julian, you, you know, in, in terms of your uh, position on fluconazole now, uh, you know, it, it is an antifungal um, drug. What um, what made made you change your mind? Just anecdotal type of um, no, evidence? Or? Just, it, it, it's, it's clear that it works. Um, I think it's fascinating that it works. You know, what what's happening when it's dosed into an aquarium is it actually uh, limiting the growth of a fungus that somehow is a symbiotic thing for the bryopsis or is it part of the biology of the bryopsis itself that's interrupted by the fluconazole? I think it's probably the latter, that it's, it's some effect on the algae directly, but um, I don't think anybody has, has studied that. And it, it was, it would, somebody else told me was that it was and it was it interferes with the enzyme some enzymes in the in the bryopsis that have to do with photosynthesis. Well, why specifically bryopsis? I have why no idea. Some other algae. Yeah, it's it, because it's, it's pretty. I don't know. <laughs> right, right. It's better. It's okay, you. It, but in any case, um, you know, it works. There's a protocol. You can follow that. I I think that it's fine. Uh, to you know, recommend it. Um, uh, I normally do a manual removal, but if I got to a point where that was too much of a bother and it wasn't helping, yeah, I, I would try. 
We have a, the coral spawning lab that we have here at the academy. Uh, I was battling bryopsis and Rich before me. It was just, we were there with tweezers pulling it off the coral skeletons, you know. Yes. It was just Great such chance. a pain in the ass. And uh, we eventually ended up tearing that system down. We did a bunch of changes to it. And now it's, it's we don't see it much at all. Yeah. Um, a couple of uh, comments and questions from the uh, viewers. Jason Langer, uh, chasing the, the nitrate phosphate ratio is getting too specific. Alkalinity and calcium is much more important. <clears throat> um, Bert Minshew. Uh, Bert mentioned something in my tank, eats it, or it just doesn't like huge uh, acrocolon. I think he's talking about um, bryopsis. <laughs> oh, we got uh, we got another guest on the show. <laughs> uh, here's a question, Becca Bits. Uh, is it true that nuisance algae will not grow directly on coralline algae? Uh, bryopsis will grow on coralline algae, but um, promoting coralline growth tends to limit other uh, algae, uh, you know, green hair algae, cyanobacteria. But well, what are and the I, things that promote, pr promote chlorine growth? Alkalinity uh, and calcium. High alkalinity and calcium, strong water flow. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I'm sure that the chlorines do release substances that um, inhibit the growth of, of other algae, but their algae certainly do grow on top of chlorines. Um, and, you know, so it's, it's a semi true statement, <laughs> not a hundred percent. Yeah. Um, all right, let's, let's, uh, let's shift gears a little bit here. And, and uh, so the last time I had you both on, we were talking about, um, RTN and STN and some possible causes and, and, uh, I'd like to get into that again, you know, on, on some past live streams, since, since you guys have been on at a, a couple of, um, <clears throat> guests on we've, we've talked about uh, some in-tank treatments using like oxalinic acid and cipro to help treat uh, rtn and stn so julian you know um chris meckley from aci aquaculture was one of those guests and and um you know we had a conversation i can't remember uh, i think it was um recently that um he mentioned that uh you initially suggested that he try the oxalinic acid you know as a uh, as a dip to treat disease corals. Can, can you kind of um, give everybody some background on, on um, you know, why you, um, how you kind of led Chris to that um, recommendation? Because we've, we've definitely been having a lot of conversations about it and, and people have been, uh, been trying that, uh, that protocol. So I, it would be interesting to kind of hear the, uh, the origin of, of how that all came about. If you, if you don't mind sharing. Well, well, so, um, I, I don't want to go in, okay. into it in depth now because I, I'd like to publish something. We, we originally, uh, well, I'll just say that it, it was a project that I started with Zach Ransom at the, when he was at Frost Science Museum. Um, there was a, a particular problem that I had been seeing, and it was frustrating me and breaking my heart all at the same time as we know as aquarium reef aquarium hobbyists when when we have these corals that that we love and then suddenly uh they're sick and they and we don't know what to do to save them um and i, I was seeing it uh with a, a certain type of coral and i i wanted to instead of just keeping you know the, the whole insanity subject, repeating the same thing and, and expecting a different result. I, I, I did keep trying and I did keep failing. And so I contacted Zach and I said, this is a microbiological problem and, and you know, we need to investigate this. Can you help me with your vet? Uh, I don't have the time nor the facility to, to really pursue this here. Uh, I know you probably do there, you know, I don't know how much manpower, whatever. We, we got into it, he agreed to do it, and uh, we did uh, some work that we have yet to publish. Um, uh, Jake's passing has a lot to do with why it isn't published yet. Uh, we were going to do a sort of a group article. Uh, initially, it was uh, Zach and me, and then you know I had shared this information with Jake and with Chris, and they did some additional work. Um, and so it, it made sense to add their experience to it. So what I can say is that number one, it will be published. 
it is going to make a huge difference. Um, I, I don't want to just, you know, throw it out there and, and have people willy-nilly, you know, throwing antibiotics in their systems. I think it's good to have the right protocols described, how, how you treat, um, and what it should be used for. Uh, in, incidentally, um, I spoke to Chris just this afternoon and really delighted to hear that he is starting a new study um, working with Roy Yanam at uh, the University of Florida. He's a, uh, a vet, uh, works with the University of Florida, uh, setting up um, a controlled experiment, studying what uh, Zach and I had looked at and doing it uh, with many replicates, as well as taking samples to um, look at bacteria uh, are involved. Uh, what are found initially and then after treatment and, and even in the controls uh, when they get sick to see if there's something there. So that's exciting. Um, and I, I think rather than getting into, you know, recommendations here, I know you want to have that as part of record and wrapping with refund, but I, I think it would be better to hit that after things are published so that it's in a more um, rigorous scientific yeah, for sure. uh, back uh, because I, I worry about um, on the one hand it's really wonderful that we as aquarium hobbyists can discover things that are of use scientifically because all of this gets back to you know uh, the fact that there are coral diseases like this in nature not just in our aquariums and so things that we discover, you know, have, have has a application there as well. But that comes with the risk that if we're we're doing things in an uncontrolled way, we, we could potentially be doing something harmful. And I, I don't want to see that uh, be a part of, of our um, history. I'd like to see it done right. And, and I, I'm excited about what uh, Zach and I found. Um, it will... Um, once published, uh, have benefits for the. Uh, well, I was um, I was also a uh, a guinea pig for uh, for this, so I I can uh, I can certainly I, I talked to Chris too uh, earlier today, and I can certainly share my uh, my data on it because I did some aquabiomics pre and post um, analyses, and and um, yeah, it was um, it was definitely some interesting uh, findings. What what I want to say is that you know. You have the, um, the veterinary uh, field is rather advanced with dogs and cats and small animals, but uh, even fishes, fairly advanced, not, but not touching the home aquarium hobby. The advancement in fishes is really for public aquariums where they may have a vet on staff. The home hobby has been off limits historically, and I think that that's a mistake personally. Um, I've had this conversation for decades with uh, people in the aquarium industry, and I get a lot of pushback uh, on my opinion. And I, you know, I'm not sure why, but it is the way it is. I, you know, think about it. Obviously, when you when your dog cat is sick. Um, Oh, we we uh we lost your audio there for a second, uh, Julian. Oh, sorry. Um, what I wanted to say was, when your dog or cat is is sick, your expense at the vet can be rather high. Um, you know, if, if those kinds of expenses were affecting the aquarium hobby, I don't know how that would go. But for a lot of us, our investment is well worth it. Um, it's hard to find a happy medium. Some, and it's first of all hard to find a vet with the experience to study, you know, tell you what you need to do for your corals. Uh, so there, there is a an open market for the, the veterinary field to specialize uh, in aquarium related stuff. Would the industry accept it? I, I don't know, but I, I think it would get us out of what I call the dark ages for for aquarium keeping because. 
there's a limited number of, of treatments available for dealing with uh, bacterial diseases available to aquarium hobbyists um, for perhaps good reasons because uh, antibiotics sold to aquarists were often used as uh, home remedies and you know for humans and that's not a good thing uh, so from my point of view having uh, vets involved where you can say yes I see you do have a problem there, and this is what you should be treating it with. Um, I, I think in the long run, it's going to be helpful. Uh, yeah, so Chris from ACI is watching and says, uh, we wouldn't be doing this study if it wasn't for you, Julian. Thank you. Um, yes. Charles, have, have you guys um, done any um, kind of dip the toe in the water in terms of in-tank antibiotic treatments for corals? Oops. Not so much intake, but definitely um, uh, baths. We use it all the time, and we've done it with, uh, well, the three chemicals that most people are talking about, um, they're all in the same family of chemicals. They're very similar. Uh, we use a, we've used what's called Batril, which is really enrofloxacin. And in mammals, when you when you give enrofloxacin to mammals, they convert it to ciprofloxacin. So it's basically that they're basically the same kind of drug. One's a derivative of the other. And so I've I've worked with um, Batril. I actually was able to stop RTN and then Acropora by doing a, a, keeping it in a separate system and basically dosing it daily. I don't think it was every three days, and then doing a hundred percent water change and dosing it again. And within seven days, it was it was fine and put it back on the tank and it started to regrow tissue. Uh, I've tried it a couple of times. It doesn't always work, uh, but it does work. And I think that to the point of what Julian was saying about being careful with these, there's a huge problem today with people disposing of uh, drugs in the, in their toilets, in their sinks and pouring these things into the municipal water system. And so if you're starting to treat aquariums with antibiotics and then you're doing a water change, where is that water going? It's going into the sewer. It's going to affect um, and it, it can promote uh, developing resistant stain, uh, strains of bacteria. That's a possibility. So there's ways that you should be treating that like by adding bleach to it before you pour it down the drain to deactivate some of these chemicals. So there's there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of worry and concern about just anybody dosing things with antibiotics because we are already seeing resistance, several strains of uh, pneumonia that are resistant to antibiotics now. And it's very rampant in hospitals. But anyway, we've, we've been using it. Um, uh, oxalinic acid is another one that we've been using, but only on fish. If, um, we actually were going to do a trial with Pospora uh, damacornis where we were going to um, take our heads of we had a ton of, if you can see the photo behind me, this is one of the heads of Postlepora that we have in the big reef tank or had in the big reef tank. Uh, we had a huge infestation of sea spiders uh, that we were battling in our coral spawning lab that also showed up in our big reef tank. And they primarily were uh, on the Damacornis. So we bit the bullet and we basically euthanized all the Damacornis we had in our big tank except mm -hmm. there's a few pieces in there and some some random planula that settled out that we've left but it was a big problem so the, the study was going to use all this damacornis and they were going to look at the microbiome of the coral with researchers at uc davis before treatment during treatment and after treatment to see what the effect would be on the microbiome um, but that didn't happen so we're looking to probably try it again and do it something uh, similar to what uh, Chris and his partners are looking at trying to do as well. Um, so yeah, we've used it um, with mixed <coughs> results, but uh, we have never dosed an entire tank other than the big reef tank where we used chemically. Gotcha. And that, and that was like our last resort. And I think, you know, that it's not, if you can remove the coral, it's probably better than treating the entire tank. That's, that's my personal opinion because you don't know what else you're going to be affecting with that because these these antibiotics are not specific to one type of bacteria, um, well, one species of bacteria, like say a pathogenic form. It's going to impact all gram negative or all gram positive bacteria or both if it's a wide spectrum antibiotic. 
and uh, you run the risk of severely damaging the, the uh, microbiome on the coral as well. Uh, you know, let's say a, a hobbyist has a situation <clears throat> where they have, you know, several mature colonies, let's call them, you know, let's say acro colonies, fully encrusted, can't remove them, <clears throat> you know, and let's say, um, let's let's take antibiotics off the table in terms of treatment options. What, what would you guys suggest a hobbyist do to, um, you know, help prevent the continued spread of the uh, that coral disease in their tank? Well, <laughs> there's not a lot of options, really. Um, you know, uh, we uh, you had shared with me the uh, the link uh, to Jake Adams. Uh, what, what did he hit say? It, throw hit a stick it with a stick. That. He was talking about it, using it antibiotics. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, but also, you know, he he also covered the, you know what can you do as alternatives, and yeah, um, there's you know fragging. Uh, what what's healthy uh, and putting that in another system uh, or it, it, he, he said it in a nice way that if if it's a isolated patch of a problem you frag that out and leave the healthy coral in the tank but if it's a coral that's that's on its way out then you frag what's healthy and, and you let it burn out and, and keep the healthy pieces elsewhere and, and then replant uh, you know, so those were our alternatives. Well, it's also the uh, the other angle is the preventative side. Is like, why do these things all of a sudden? You know, we hear stories all the time about people that have a coral that they've had for a long time, and all of a sudden it starts to run. Well, why is that? Um, what's changed in the system? What's caused the balance to change? I mean, there is already there's papers that have been published on certain strains of um, bacteria that. Um, become virulent above a certain temperature so below a certain temperature it's fine but when it goes above a certain temperature for whatever reason reason it starts attacking the coral tissue so there's those kinds of things to look at it's flow as these tanks get older and the colonies get bigger your water flow starts to drop off um, one thing that we've noticed in our big reef tank we had some issues um, with our phosphate and discovered that our phosphate was much higher than we originally thought it was and it was up to, up to 0.7 parts per million and we've now got it down to less than 0.3 and we used to we had a very large colony of hydnophora about six feet across uh, that would get batches of um, brown jelly constantly um, and that's another uh, that reminds me there's another treatment that we've done with that we would uh, we there's a coral paste that's developed by the Florida Aquarium and other researchers to battle the uh, stony coral tissue loss disease in Florida, which has ampicillin in it. So we do use a coral paste with ampicillin in it, and we would put that on these areas of the hydnophora, and that would battle the, uh, and, and knock out the brown jelly as well. And you can also use Cipro in a, in a paste or in, a, in, a, um, in, a, in a, an epoxy that way. But since lowering that phosphate level, we haven't seen any brown jelly since. And it's just, it's purely anecdotal. It could be just coincidence, but I, I've read enough scientific papers that have talked about the deleterious effects of high nutrients on coral's ability to fight off disease. So there's that. Interesting. Could be. I, I wanted to throw out that, we, you know, first of all, you went back to the question of what things could you do. We did talk earlier about adding bacteria. So there is one school of thought of probiotics instead of antibiotics. And I believe that as time goes on, that will be a, uh, an area that will, a branch that will grow and not get pinched off. <laughs> you know, I, I don't think that we're gonna see the battle between anti and probiotics uh, end up with one winner. I think we'll find both are useful. Um, I'm glad Charles brought up the, uh, the paste and an epoxy method that that's being used on wild reefs and it has some potential benefit for home aquariums as well. You're directly applying the antibiotic on the lesion where it's needed instead of in the water where it affects so many other things. I wanted to add one more thing to the question of what as that Charles posted as to why does this happen? You know, why a coral that's healthy suddenly becomes sick? 
Um, does everybody know what the observer effect is in physics? And this is kind of tongue in cheek. <laughs> Look up the observer effect. It's really fascinating. And think about how much time we spend looking at our aquariums. We are the observer. And could it be that something about us looking at our corals makes them sick? <laughs> it's a little bit um, out there of an idea, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> why, why is it that the most treasured coral, the one that we ah, don't want to get sick, is the one if you have a hundred giant clams, the most beautiful one, stop looking at it. <laughs> it's going to die. <laughs> anyway, that's like the idea of if you want to make algae go away, you have to cherish it. It's the reverse. Who knows if, if psychology and, and I, I think you got something there. <laughs> physics. Julian. I, I, you know, there, there is Sorry. something there. There's sometimes you just get the bad mojo, you know, and yeah, you know, tell me about sometimes it. <laughs> it's, it's karma sucks sometimes. And well, it, it comes around every year, you know, uh, when, when RTN starts hitting people's tanks, they start talking about, well, it's springtime again. It's gotta be the pollen. Um, but I don't know. I, maybe observe. I saw that in a com <laughs> somebody made a comment about that just before in the, uh, in the chat. About just to follow up on that too. Yeah. I mean, have you noticed that when you go away on vacation and you come back, things look really good. Yeah, they do. They do. You, you not make, always, you know, not oh, always, you, but sometimes. Yeah, yeah if you're very not well, with the what, tank all the time, and sticking your arms in there. That's why. Right. You know what? What often happens when your way is, is a, something gets knocked over, and that that's bad. But otherwise, things seem to be happy. Um, yeah. When I uh, I set up that five thousand gallon tank in, in Hawaii, and uh, it was covered with diatoms like strings this long off the rocks, looked awful. I went on vacation right after that. Came back, everything was pristine. It was beautiful. Yeah. Um, there you go. Question for both you guys, and I'm 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 assuming we don't have data to support this, but uh, do you do you believe that uh, every reef tank has some coral pathogens in there, some some bad bacteria, and that um, you know they 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 kind of come out yeah. and dominate when there is some sort of um, instance of instability or, or something changes, and that's when they can kind of proliferate when things would weaken a coral. Would, would you say that's a fair thing to say in terms of everybody's probably got some coral pathogens in their tank? Well, it's the same question, but, uh, you know, looked at it in a different way. I, I think without a doubt, pathogens are present in every They're present in us. Yeah, right. And in every reef, they're all there. Um, as to the question of there needing to be something that destabilizes the system to make them do their bad things, that's been an argument for years. And I remember Richard Harker had that argument, and I used to disagree strongly on it. For just I, I, I felt that I, I had no way to measure to be able to answer that. But my sense was that that the proliferation of a pathogen causing problems seem to be just a total random thing. Uh, there's no doubt that a, if you destabilize the tank, your chiller went out and the temperature went out. There, there are things that you can do and provably make a pathogen problem come about. But then you, if you've been in the hobby long enough, you know that there are times when everything is just fantastic and you're taking pictures and you're bragging about how wonderful your tank is. And the next day, <laughs> RTN hits it. Observer effect. I'm telling you, there's something about it. <laughs> and I think there's um, also something to the fact that yeah. not all coral, like we, 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 again, we, we tend to generalize too much in this hobby. A coral is not a coral. They're all into every species is different. And some of them just are, I mean, yeah, even, you know, they see this within a cropper. Like there are some species of a cropper that do well with high nutrient levels and grow well, and other ones that just can't handle it. Uh, we spent f several years working with a cropper hyacinthus in our spawning lab, and it was nothing but one, one problem after another. We've since moved to Millipora, and it's not, never been an issue. They're fine. 
So we just happened to pick the most sensitive one to start with, right? Also the one that was the most unreliable spawner. So, you know, it's, these things are different and, uh, you know, and some of them are more resistant to disease than others. They definitely do have uh, immunity uh, uh, systems that they use. And uh, despite what people have said in the past, they do have, and there's lots of papers now talking about the immune response in corals. So, yeah. I wanted to add one thing that does happen with time in every aquarium is that as the corals grow, they, you know, and take up more space that affects the water flow and it, you know, um, shading, all of those things can promote disease. Um, you know, shading causes tissue loss, uh, growth of the corals, put them in proximity of other corals, whether, where they may sting each other, um, you know, in just the right amount to promote a, an infection. So, you know, you really do have to be staying on top of the pruning to keep things um, perpetually happy. And going back to the alkalinity and calcium too, I mean, you know, you, it's, it's better to have that higher alkalinity. That's been shown that research at the biosphere too, that's proved that the higher the alkalinity, the more able the corals are to tolerate higher nutrient levels and less prone mm -hmm. to disease. And so um, it basically has to do with the calcium carbonate saturation state in the water as well. But having high, you know, the question that researchers said, how are these hobbyists keeping these corals with these high phosphorus and nitrogen levels compared to a reef? And what they came to the conclusion was is that the alkalinity is much higher in these systems, which allows these corals to be able to tolerate that. Um, Rob Upstate New York, thank you very much for the uh, super chat. Uh, the comment is great chat, gentlemen. And thanks, Julian, for Acura C1 small batch mixes. The wife loves her kitchen scale back. <laughs> yes. Um, Wait for you so you don't have to use her. Um, yeah. Uptown Reef, Reef Bum, what do these guys take on the bacterial benefits of a cryptic sump of live rock? You know, we talked about cryptic sumps, uh, I think, the last time I had you guys on because I, uh, I started one. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I like that technique. Uh, that's uh, Steve Tyree who promoted that and wrote a book about it. But, um, yeah, it's just a, it's a little thing that you can add to a system. Uh, you, you have not just the rock, but sponges grow in there, and the sponges uh, do kind of like a biological filter. They have nitrifying bacteria that live in their pores in their system. And uh, yeah, it, it works so you can incorporate it. Um, so guys, I think um, I've, uh, I've probably kept you long enough and I, and I know that um, we uh we had a delay at the beginning so i uh, i really appreciate you uh you hanging in there for this long with uh with us our pleasure my pleasure yeah no yeah. problem um no problem so yeah. listen i um i want to i want to put a wrap on this but thank you again guys so much for uh for coming together and, and and joining us tonight it was a uh it was a great learning experience as always and we really appreciate having you on so thank you my pleasure. Um, so that's going to do it for the live stream tonight. I want to thank both Julian and Charles for being on the show. And also want to thank Bolt Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine for sponsoring the live stream and supporting the show. And also want to thank all you folks out there for tuning in um, and watching and contributing to the conversation. Really appreciate that. I uh, also want to thank Paul, who's the moderator, as well as the president of the Boston Reefer Society. Please join and support your local reefing clubs. They are so important to this hobby. Uh, finally, I want to let you know that all episodes of Wrap on the Reef Bum are available as podcasts on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and Amazon. My next Wrap on the Reef Bum live stream will be next Thursday, April 13th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with Matt Peterson from Coral and Amazonas Magazine. So that should be another great show. If you want to catch the full schedule of upcoming guests, visit reefbum.com under the YouTube section. Until then, be safe and be well, and we will see you next time.